so much easier. But I'm, I'm not. Taylor, you're unexcused. What? Yeah, you're, you're just in trouble. I have. Am I actually having <laughs> No, but Maggie is. Oh. No, she's here. I'm so confused. What are we missing? <laughs> Quit emailing me. <laughs> and have you thought about the Reaper? Halloween is coming up. You want a costume? Yeah. If you people dress up as the Grim Reaper, how about the Mechanical Reaper? No, no, it's better. It's better. So you have the Mechanical Reaper, right? Then have your other friends dress as wheat, and you can be chasing them. Oh my god. As long as there is no clown. Yeah. Yeah. I was in the fair today, there was a clown around one of the schools. Hawthorne. Was it Hawthorne? Yeah. Oh, and, you know, the, um, all like places that sell like Halloween costumes, they were told by the police that they had to take off all the clown costumes. Yeah. But it was after the fact that they had sold Actually, the police can't make them get rid of clown costumes, but I'm, I think it's more of a recommendation. You know, they can't come in, you can't sell that. But. Wait, what? Why can't you sell Because you're the, part of it. the people that are dressing up as the creepy human clowns are saying they're going to do a purge on Halloween. Oh, it's oh, Halloween costumes, yeah. and they're going to kill the rest of the people. It's on Monday, though. So people are Yeah, Monday, that's why. Let's, let's get back to my idea. Let's go check out the The Mechanical <laughs> Reaper and Grain. You mean Grain? I have the Reaper chase him. I think that would be the most. What have you been for Halloween? I'm just curious. What's that? What have you been for Halloween? What have I been? Yeah. Every year I dress up with something different. It's a radical, it's a crazy costume every year. Are you just for Example. <laughs> yeah, I don't want Prey. I don't think I've dressed up for Halloween in, once again, nearly 30 years. <laughs> Why don't you do it once? It kind of gets me. Alright, so, <laughs> nine. The ninth factor is capitalism. And capitalism is the new, capitalism is the new economic system that be created with the Industrial Revolution. Before there was proto-capitalism, and Adam Smith, in many ways, considered the founder, even though, in reality, he wrote the book that would... It, he actually took from a couple of Arab philosophers, but people remember Adam Smith. In 1776, he wrote a book with this very long title, because books back then had a long title, but all we care about is what everybody calls it, and that's why it's bolded, the wealth of nations. And 1776, what else happened in 1776? What's that, Taylor? You said it. Yeah, the Declaration of Independence. And Adam Smith was a Scotsman, a philosopher, and the Industrial Revolution was just beginning around him. Remember, they had the fast moving streams in Scotland. And he wrote this book. There's him, and he is always forever facing north. The green picture is Adam Smith right next to Rat Time. And Rat Time is still there. Adam Smith, brilliant man in a lot of ways, but yeah, he did take control of their philosophers. And in it, he laid down the first, at least concise book about how the market functions. Now, this is still pre capitalism, but it's going to have great influence. And in some ways, it is absolutely brilliant. Yeah, it's wrong on a couple things. People quote Adam Smith all the time. They out of the day, I actually read Adam Smith. I had to read Adam Smith in college. And I was one of those like, oh, God, I don't want to read this. And it was really interesting once I got my mind wrapped around 18th century prose. Because there are pages, like a page and a half on one part, that's one sentence. Wow. It just flows different. It's just so totally different. And so you have to, so if you just, it's tough to wrap your mind around, but once you get used to it, it's a really good author, really good, interesting stuff. But let's get to the basic element of it. What he was talking about was he was looking at mercantilism. He's looking at this government control of various parts of the economy, especially how government created monopolies. What was the company that Britain gave a monopoly of tea set, which a lot of reasons for the Declaration, or Declaration of Independence? East India. Yeah, that East India Company. And he said, this is government picking favors, it's inefficient, creating monopoly. What we need to do is get closer and closer to a free market. And so in it is one of the best examples, one of the first, of something we call 
a free market. Now, you notice I put it in quotes because there's never been in the history of the world a free market. There's always been some kind of manipulation. It could be by big business, by individuals, whoever has the guns. It could be by government. And some of this could be good manipulation, bad manipulation. There's always been. So we're talking about the idealized situation. And let's be clear about what a market is. A market in this context is in microeconomics terms. Basically what I mean is one particular sale of one particular good. So like for example, if we all went out and sold frozen orange juice. All of us got in the business of selling frozen orange juice, which I know is kind of the dream of all of you. Someday sell frozen orange juice. That would be the frozen orange juice market. Or if we all sold you know, dry eraser pens. The dry eraser pen market. So we're talking about one market for one good, not like the market as a store. And so we're talking on the micro scale. Now, macro is like the whole nation's economy. So you have micro and macro economics. So we're talking basically micro. Every economics class has this. Oh, and economics is not the same as business. It's not the same thing. We're talking about economics is basically, and this is the uh, how people deal with the scarcity of goods. Scarcity just simply means there's a limited, finite amount of most goods. There's only so much food. There's only so much frozen orange juice, which is a shame, right? I spent, that's why I lived an entire year of college, frozen orange juice. No water, just frozen orange juice. That was my Go to the pack. Uh, that's why. <laughs> And so this is the generic one they'll show in every economics class, the supply and demand curve. It doesn't quite look like this, but it just gives you something generic. And basically what it is is this. Here's supply. And it's saying this. If the price is low, you won't produce as much. The price is high, you produce more. Demand, same thing. If the price is really high, you won't buy as much. If the price is low, you'll buy more. Just generic. That makes sense? What happens is, in this, is you find some equilibrium where they supply enough to meet the demand and not the set of price. That is the basic generic curve, and these will almost always be different angles. It doesn't work this way. Heck, for a national, for macroeconomics, the demand curve goes like this. You know, and the supply goes like this. It's really, it's much more complex. It's generic. But what we're talking about first is everyone's operating their own self-interest. Which Smith hated. Idea of a bunch of greedy people operating on self interest. But if everybody's operating you know, at their own self interest, and then one important thing is we all have to know what's going on. We have to have transparency. So there can't be hidden information in the free market. As you well know, there's a lot of information in the free market, in the marketplace, I mean. So this never happens. But idealize. We're all operating on self interest, therefore we'll look out for ourselves. But I gotta repeat. That has never happened. So, next. What we have is then, in a free market, there's competition. So you have different people coming in to sell frozen orange juice. Some make it, some don't. And that is the risk. There's a lot of risk in competition. But competition makes sure there's good products. Hey, you put out a bad product, you won't sell. Put out a good product, not only will you sell, but it will force other competitors either to make good products or go out of business. So competition, but there's a lot of risk. And let's be clear about it. Everybody who goes in business hates this. They like a situation where there's no competition and no risk. Which, by the way, therefore, you don't have a market anymore because you control the market. But everybody wants that. What do you call that situation when you get rid of competition and get rid of risk? Yeah, something that operates like a monopoly. And that's, you know, let's be clear about it. You know, it's only one company. Sells the game. Did I just blow your mind? Yeah. Boom. Okay, I gotta bring you back now. Put the pieces of your brain back together. And so, something that operates like a monopoly. So you got all these people entering. Now we're talking about a free market. This is a generic market where we can all come in and we can sell. All, everybody can come in and buy a market. Where prices are decided, everything's decided by supply and demand in the free market. The interaction of supply and demand. 
And so basically what it is, if something's in demand, the price will be higher. If something is not in demand, the price drops. The same deal, if there's an oversupply of something, the price drops. Under supply, the price goes up. Now, of course, it's got to be products that people want. Yeah, there might be an undersupply of wooden shoes, but the odds are you're probably not going to really charge very much. I should want wooden shoes. The great one floods, that kind of thing. It's not shit, right? So, this sets the price, this interaction of supply and demand. So, the idea being that if you charge too much for frozen orange juice, you go out of business. You charge too little, you won't make money. If you make a bad product, you go up. This interaction, and by the way, it's cutthroat. By definition, this is cutthroat. You're either in or out. We're not helping each other. We help each other, but that's not a free market anymore. You know, we two, two competitors get together and say, hey, let's corner the orange juice market. Yeah, no longer have a free market. So, next. What we have, therefore, is we're all looking for profit margins. Profit margins are different between cost and revenues. So revenues are the amount of money you bring in, the cost is the cost you, to produce. And that's buying the capital and labor. You know, they are different. Now, which one do you control in the frozen orange juice market? The cost or the revenues? Yeah, you really only control cost. Revenues are really decided by the price in the marketplace. Sure, you might want to come up with a better product in the short term, have a you have an advantage, but you know everyone's going to catch up. Only thing you really control is the cost. So you can't just simply say, I'm going to raise prices because I'm not making enough money. It doesn't happen that way. It doesn't happen that way at all. And so, I mean, look how many stores, when they get near going out of business, they drop prices because they're just trying to make money. Yeah, he's they were 99% off. Yeah, I saw, I saw that some guy standing in the street corner with a started 20, 40, 60, 80. And by the way, that does tell you a lot about the cutthroat nature of the market. You know, 20 years ago, Hastings was constantly busy. I mean, they made incredible, incredible amount of profit. You change the market, all of a sudden you go from being you know, the people used to rent videos and DVDs and buy books at bookstores, all of a sudden, boom, it's gone. And we'll talk more about that later because that's competitive advantage. So, how do you cut costs? The best way to cut costs is to have an efficient division of labor. Now, let's be clear about we're talking about employees here. And the only reason that companies hire employees, I'm going to say something that sounds so completely obvious that you're going to say, well, of course. But the only reason that companies hire employees is because they believe their work will add value, have them a chance to make more profit, to sell more. Now, I said that you think, of course. But a lot of people will say, and you hear this all the time, you just give money to people with money and they're the job creators. So they'll create jobs. No, they will only create jobs if they will make them money. So it's more complex than that. But back to this then. Division of labor. Adam Smith used the example of pins. And I'm talking about sewing pins, P-I-N-S. And back in 1776, it's hard to make a pen. You had to um, puddle the steel, which is actually making of the steel, iron, nickel, a few other things together. It was called puddling because it would bubble. And pouring a mold. You had to make the mold very difficult. You had to and you have to time it exactly right to open it and file it down because always get a little edge, but make it a pin. Labor intensive. One person does all that. They don't become really good at each individual part. Production is relatively slow, they wear down. But with Smith said, something that once again we take a look at and say, obviously, you have one person do the puddling of steel, another person does the fire, burn the coal. So that plenty of heat. One person makes the bowl, one person actually pours the bowl, one person takes it out, one person files it. Etc. You become really good at one task, what happens? Assembly. We're coming, exactly, you can tell that will fit right into interchangeable parts and then the assembly line. And you become efficient, don't you? If you're only puddling the steel, you become really good at puddling the steel. So you work faster. And so on. And so, if you have enough, you're big enough to hire all those people, you 
even though you're hiring more people, you become more efficient. You become more efficient, it does what to your costs. And that's the key. But there's one more thing. Wouldn't labor, couldn't you just drop wages? Can't do that. Because in a free market, what sets, please do the right one. What sets the mice? Now oh, we've got to Adam Smith. The wage system. In a free market, especially in this new system that's coming up called capitalism, wages are set in the market too. Wages are set in the same exact market. If there's a demand for a certain type of worker, what happens to their wages? Hmm? If there's an oversupply of that very same worker because everyone got that same training in five years, what happens to their wages? If you're highly skilled, what will that do to your wages? Nothing. Nothing. All that matters is if that skill is in demand. If that skill is not in demand and you're really highly skilled, it doesn't matter. You're not going to pay much. How about hard work? What happens if you're the hardest and best worker? What happens to your wages? It doesn't matter. Unless there's a real shortage of people. I can tell you something, you do it. Okay, I might have to pay you more because there's like one of you. Come on, I'm looking at you. You be that worker? Sure. <laughs> sure, give me a right. But <laughs> if profits go up for the company, what happens to wages? Hmm? Doesn't affect them. Did everyone catch what I just said there? Did everyone catch that? If profits go up, if the company makes money, it has no effect on wages. None. The scary thing is if property go if profits go down, what does it do to wages? No. Because wages are set in the market. Yeah, the company would like to cut wages if their profit goes down, but they can't because they still gotta hire the workers. If they cut wages, their workers will go to a different place. We're talking a free market where everyone can move freely. So, has anyone had a job out in the real world? A few, right? No, I mean, okay, I know you work for some job, you know, like for uh, your parents or I'm not saying it's not work, but it, the pay is different when it's your, your, your uncle or something. You have a job where you've worked with other people. Hmm, like a grocery store, restaurant, anything like that, and done that. So you work with a lot of people, right? You're all basically paid the same, aren't you? Is there somebody who doesn't do a damn thing and they're paid exactly the same as you? Or maybe you're that person who doesn't do anything and you're paid the same and you know it. That happens in every field. I always think it's funny when they say in the private industry they can fire workers and cut the fat. No. We've all, you will soon know it doesn't work that way. DJ was like, I know who. You know exactly who, right? Isn't the wage system awesome? No. <laughs> For example, yeah, they, they will pay whatever the market will bear. Now, Walmart, they made a big deal. Walmart, who pays notoriously very low wages, Walmart had to raise the wages a little bit. And people say, wow, you know. Um, or this might affect the wage system. No, the reason they did is because nobody stayed there because it was such a difficult place to work. Walmart is always hiring. Yeah, why? Because you, they always have new people there. It's a very, they, they try to squeeze as much profit as they can out of very, very individual workers. They had to raise it because they were losing workers. Yeah, I, I have a job. I mean, I can go down there. I mean, people like me, we do nothing. And then other teachers down the hall, they do everything. We don't well, that's a system of it's waste. And this is the bad part. Well, actually, there's two bad parts for the workers. First off, no matter how hard you work, you produce that extra. I mean, you work extra hard, and you get more produced. Does that affect your pay? That's fantastic. It really is. Yeah, you might get one and say, wow, you know, they're really a good worker. I'm a shortage of good workers. I'll do that. But if you have everybody doing that, I, it would be nice, you would think, but that's not the way the market works. It's cut throat, remember? And one more thing. Let's say you get out of school, out of high school, and you think, I'm going to go to college or some other thing, you know, some, and I'm going to get this 
you know, I'm going to learn a lot in college, but also get some kind of skill, so I'll go get a job and be successful, you know, whatever your idea of success might be. Will it work? You've got to go and find something that's in demand. If you have something that's not in demand, or not in demand in 10 years, that's where it gets scary. What's going to happen? I mean, really, your, your idea here should be as absolutely flexible as you can. Learn as much as you can about as many things as possible. Th learn to think as much as you can because you might have to adapt. Things are different than was when I was a kid. I remember the 1990s. They're telling students, I remember counselors coming in, all these people, things are over and over again. Computer science, getting to computers, computer program. Oh my God, that, it's just, it's just jobs are just amazing. Just, just jump right in, you'll be paid more than everybody else. But what did everybody do? <laughs> Early 2000s, at least computer science classes went up dramatically. And so what are happening to wages there? They're not, they are dropping a little bit, but they've been stagnant for 15 years. So what, what it means is if they're stagnant, when you create inflation, they're not, they're actually dropping a little bit. I'm not saying you shouldn't find a job, but if you're interested in it, yeah. But the point is that is the reality of it. It's supply and demand. It's not the skill that's important, it's the skill that's in demand. I mean, back to the wood and chew analogy, I might be the greatest baker of wood and chews in the world. It's probably not going to affect my wages that much. And this is something that's very interesting because looking at the top jobs over the next 20 years, what they predict, and these have been notoriously flawed, but these are jobs that are going to be in demand with skills. And only two of the top 20 require a college diploma. Actually, the number one thing are going to be things like plumbers and masons. There's going to be such a shortage of that, well, of the skilled ones. There is going to be such a shortage, it is going to be like a crisis. If you, I mean, if, I mean that's hard work, but boy, if you could, a plumber, oh my goodness, in about 10 years, you could pretty much name your place. It's hard work. And actually, if you work in, in new construction, I talked to guys who do it, that's actually kind of, it's actually kind of fun, I think, you have to kind of plot it out. The plumbing in current houses, I think you know that that can be, that's a, that's a tough job <laughs> in a lot of different ways. I am, but they're smart. I mean, smart people, I have a lot of respect for them. But they don't have college diplomas, but they have certainly other kind of training. You know what the other two jobs that require college diplomas? Lawyer. Huh? Lawyer. No. Let's go out of lawyers. Mm. Nurses. Mm. Teachers. Mm. There's going to be a massive shortage. Of yeah. Unprecedented. <laughs> huh? So the teachers and nurses don't get paid enough. Everything's relative. Teaching, if you work long enough, it becomes a very good middle class life. But they, and it depends where you're at. If you're at places like North Carolina, okay, anything. And boy, there's going to be such a shortage there. Here's decent. Yeah. Texas really bad. It's a huge shortage. What I mean is that the wages have to go up or they'll replace them with computers that look so well. So, that is the wage system. No, the computers. You really hate online classes. Well, they, are, they are really bad. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't want to learn anything, right. you're great. But what? Yeah. Yeah, what did they say in the study about online, online math is equivalent to losing 180 days of education in an online math class? Yeah, the equivalent of losing a year of school. Online, online classes involve reading 160 days. Online is a joke. And I'm being recorded. It's a joke! As I send this online. <laughs> Alright, so, boss, I'm fair. What Adam Smith said in a perfect world, if government stays hands off, so it doesn't give like, good benefits, you like monopolies to some companies, the economy will function better. And that was boss, I'm fair, but only in a perfect world. I gotta be clear about this. Only in a perfect world. And this is, by the way, where most big business stop. They talk about Adam Smith and say, laws I fair. Because if you don't, if you just let the market function, everybody acting greedily, remember what I told you, this never happens. Never has happened. But the what will happen in the long run, the visible hand of the market will decide the prices, what companies will survive, good products, it will encourage innovation to get a competitive advantage. And yes. In the market, we've never had a free market, we've always had a controlled market in some way. This does happen. But this is only a perfect world. 
because we do not have an open market where anybody can go in and sell stuff, anybody can go in and buy stuff, anyone get a job, you can maybe switch jobs. It doesn't work that way. Trust me. It doesn't work that way. You just can't pack up and move and go to another place overnight. But Adam Smith died. <laughs> That's his grave. He died before the Industrial Revolution really took place. Yes, I have to make the pilgrimage to Adam Smith's grave. It's in Circle, Montana. It's not here. Well, at, no, it's in Edinburgh, Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I told you to tell him. Wow! Circle's where the gray people live. That's another story. He died. Is there even a circle? <laughs> oh yeah, there's a circle, Montana. There is. Oh, yeah, that's where the gray people live. Somebody I'll tell you about. Well, what we have though with capitalism is something very much different. Capitalism is an economy where you have two very distinct classes. It is a market, but unlike before, where merchants and the actual workers are relatively close, we have this market. I know I, I made the print small because I know you are young and or spry. Some of you are both, but back here, very strong. Yeah, I can read that. I'm not. <laughs> I say I, I, have, I have bad eyes. She has 20, 4,008. All right, so that's called hyperbole. We have the capitalist, the person who controls the capital. They're also going to be called the bourgeoisie, which is a word that I've never spelled. That's part of the it is so hard. I spelled it like 20 different ways. Here's the deal. They take the risk because they have to buy the capital. But they get the profits. But see, once you start going to capital machines, fewer and fewer people can afford to buy it. That's a major investment. If you lose, it's a huge risk. So by very nature, capitalism, where it's machines now doing the work, the capital... Fewer and fewer people can be the actual capitalist. And then you have everybody else, the labor. Sometimes you see it referred to as a proletariat. That's from uh, the working class, lower class in Rome, ancient Rome. And they don't get the profit. They are on the wage system. And they're very distinct classes. Here are all the workers and farmers bowing to the monopolists. That's a cartoon from the 1870s, the capitalists. And by its very nature, this group is going to get smaller and smaller because every new technological invention, invention is more expensive, it costs more money to make that capital investment, and therefore only a few will do it. And then I just like the picture of work, people working endless hours. Just think about it for a second, you do the same thing over and over again for 20, for 12 hours a day. And it would be... <laughs> Did we talk about cap the goals of capitalism every day? No. Okay, thank you. You <laughs> 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 do it at the same place every day. Huh? You do it at the same place every day. But you don't do the exact same place. Awesome? Yeah, the one thing hey, like, just sitting there, go. like imagine if the person with like ADHD having to do that job and just sitting there all day. I would go Well, and then the thing is, is well actually, uh well, we're not going to get into the psychology of this. So, so laissez-faire capitalism is different. It doesn't quite work at all the way that Adam Smith thought. Because everyone thought, okay, well, let the market decide all their own self-interest. And by the way, if you read this quote, he didn't like the people who are going to be the, the capitalists and all that. He thought they were, well, <laughs> their natural selfishness. He thought they were the three most horrible people in the world, but he also thought this is the best system. But the market will decide, sure, but there's a big problem. And the problem happens with capitalism almost overnight. It's not necessarily a problem that can't be solved, can't be a problem you can deal with, but it is a problem in the marketplace. And it's this, all the profit goes to the owners. And the story is, he who has the capital gets the profit. Right? I mean, that's, that's why you take the risk. But I think you can see where this is going. If all the profit goes to the fewer, the, the small percentage of people who have the capital, who are you going to sell to? The market, in reality, will promote. Now, inequality. 
inequality on its surface is not necessarily bad. I mean, if you sit here right now, you, and look at somebody who has a job, an occupation, they do something that you like and admire and like what they have, it might promote, commit you to work harder and try to reach that goal. And if you also see somebody who, you know, they didn't work hard and uh, have bad breaks and, you know, live in a box by the river, you think, I don't want to be them. So inequality on the surface is not all that necessarily bad. Now, how much inequality can be a ticking time bomb for a country? And so, the reason why is this. Economy is a scale. Put a box around economy is a scale, put a star, put an asterisk. Uh, what other things we can do with that? Underline it, highlight it, italicize, and bold it. This is the iron rule of economics. I would argue it's the iron rule of life. And remember, we've already kind of said it. Once you have machines, once you have factories, once companies get bigger, the bigger they are, remember division of labor? You can, all things being equal, become more efficient. The bigger you are, the more efficient you become. The more efficient you become, you cut your costs. Therefore, the bigger you are, the greater competitive advantage you have. Always, period. End of conversation. The bigger you are, the competitive advantage you have. I'm not talking, I'm just being big in this terms of capitalism. You have more machines, bigger factory, therefore you could have more workers that could become more efficient. You can use a division of labor to cut costs. And also, if you're bigger, if you're bigger, you can actually drop your costs a little bit because you can absorb losses in the short run. The bigger has a competitive advantage. And we can see this time after time. We see it right here. You think of the competitive advantage that Walmart has. It's unbelievable, the competitive advantage. Costco to a lesser degree, degree, but yeah, and in fact, Costco is able to sell things at a lower cost because being bigger, they sell more. Or, one of the biggest competitive advantages, Amazon. Amazon used to not. Amazon has a massive competitive advantage because of the amount they sell, and now they can be incredibly efficient in their warehouses. And they charge a lot, because if you order something like a brand, like a certain store, like it's like that big break. Well, what that is is stores that go into their network because they're desperate to try to get in. But Amazon, for all, most things they sell that they use, they actually sell significantly more. Mm -hmm. Significantly, like if you go well, books is where they started. But the point is, they can drive out smaller competitors. I mean, Amazon sells a significant number of things at well below cost because they know you will go buy stuff and to buy other stuff if they can sell higher. You know, one of the best examples I just read about this Costco and but grocery stores do this, but Costco is one of the best examples. They actually lose about one third of the cost, one third of their value for rotisserie chicken. You know what I'm talking about? You buy that chicken. They charge only about 65% of what that it costs. But they're so big, they know they can absorb those losses because when people go in to get a chicken at Costco, what else are they doing? They're buying all the other stuff. Because they try to give you samples and buy it. But that's why they do that. It's worth the cost. They have a competitive advantage. So if you think about if you go to Walmart, and you're going to say, I'm going to start my own grocery store next and look at it next to Walmart. How long will you last? And then what they can do is, Amazon's a really good example. Once you become that big, you can manipulate the market. You can drive people out of business. You get people to try to come to you to sell things, which is uh, what you were talking about. But one of the best things they can do is then use their power to get special laws for you. Amazon doesn't have to go through the process of charging people for a sales tax. But we don't have one here, but virtually every state, other state does. So that automatically gives them a lower price than they have to pay for collecting sales tax. So they have a huge, I mean, we're talking um, unimaginable, like something like $400 billion a year competitive advantage by not collecting sales tax. Is this technically good for the consumer if lower prices exist? In the short run, it's good for the consumer. In the long run, it's really bad for because once you get a monopoly, they can raise prices, but also once you have only one or two companies controlling all the everything, you know, all the jobs, 
gave force rate is called, um, I can't ever say the constant, the exact amount of term. Jeff? Well, back in the 90s, they were trying to encourage, they were trying to encourage internet business, and so they said they didn't have to, and then now they make sure because they have a lot of money, they give a lot of money to politicians. Yeah. And then uh, the owner now of Amazon, or one of the guys who started it, he owns like one of the most prominent newspapers to make sure that the newspapers don't ever say anything. He owns the Washington Post. Now, by me saying that, I probably won't be here tomorrow. All right, so, <laughs> actually, I won't be here tomorrow. But Monday, <laughs> and here's the issue this is get to the black bar really quick. With no equality, you don't have a free market anymore. The free market does not function. If you have one big company, because if it's one big one, who can compete? And so what we have is further concentration of wealth. Economies of scale leads to more concentration of wealth, which also makes it more difficult to compete, which will concentrate wealth even more. And so capitalism, because of the nature of the machines, has this problem. Now, it's not a problem, I guess, if you're the one who has all the machines. You know, I'm just using machines as capital. But it eats itself. Capitalism will eat itself. It doesn't mean that there are amazing things that come out of capitalism. But by driving out the competitors, and also by aggressively cutting costs, eventually, who will be left to buy your stuff? Nobody. And that is a problem we have today. It's called secular stagnation. But we have not enough demand for how much stuff now that they can raise. That keeps wages low and it keeps us, you know, we, okay, we had looked at the initial economic numbers that came out today were, were pretty good, but we had a lot of quarters of really bad economic numbers. Japan's going through, been going through secular stagnation since the 1990s. Europe is going through it now, it's like hitting like a sledgehammer. And China's starting secular stagnation. There's not enough demand. Not enough people to buy stuff. So what happens? Companies don't sell as much, profits go down. The profits go down, people don't invest. Don't invest, there's fewer jobs. And lastly, what did Adam Smith say? Government. Government must have a role. It's not loss I fair. Government must try to do things to to ensure equality. And then, if you get equality, then hands off. We, the US government did that, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, really aggressively trying to keep companies from getting too big. They don't do that at all. So that's capitalism. It's a really interesting thing. Adam Smith, self interest. And then, two cartoons I thought were funny. <laughs> and I like this. <laughs> One of my favorite cartoons is guy named Tom Tomorrow, and that's a, it's actually the first screen of, of a cartoon like on the left. And the other one I just thought was clever. I don't know what that, it must be number one. I don't know what the finger means, but I'm, I'm, I'm innocent. Uh, so, on Monday, we're going to come in, I'll throw the questions up real fast, and then we'll have five minutes. Brainstorm list, how many things must be on the brainstorm list, please? 17. Top 15. Oh, seven, let's go 17. I'm not afraid of seven. At least 15 things. Two to three facts per paragraph. Now think about the thesis statement. A good, let's get the main point of the question, take a position, good blueprint, and then where do you put the broad? I just, just put it in the cauldron. Well, I won't. I don't. Bribes won't help your brain.